Hey, uh, thanks. <clears throat> Uh, hi everybody. Um, sorry if I'm a little like bleary-eyed or yawn. Uh, I currently live in Sweden and it's uh, 6:30 in the morning right now. So um, thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, uh, final, final talk here the the day. Uh, your takeaways from this talk um, are going to be that uh, um, anecdotally, like civility in general in, in the games industry is improving, um, but it's still like really, really low. Um, there's plenty of marginalized groups that have been saying this for years, of course, um, but uh, uh, in case you're waiting for the generic phase of video games to say it, um, there you go. Um, win friends and influence people. Um, this is kind of a no-brainer. Um, people like helpful people. Um, I got a level with you. I may be a veteran, but I'm not like the best programmer. Uh, I get hired because the interview is over. Uh, I seem like somebody that they actually want to hire. It's somebody they want to find a position for. Um, should probably have kept all that a secret, but whatever. Um, and you'll become a better developer, hopefully. Um, remember that being a programmer is more than just writing code. Uh, you're part of a team that's working together to make something great. Uh, and even if you're a solo dev, um, you're absolutely going to need uh, those soft skills because you're going to be doing your own marketing as well. Um, so actually, let's uh, let's back this up a moment. And I'm going to be a bit bold and change the name of my talk midstream. Um, and let's just say it's how to be a better programmer um, because companies want the best candidate. Uh, and that isn't necessarily the person with the strongest technical skills. Uh, by improving your so-called soft skills, you become a better programmer in as much as you are more appreciated at your current job and will be more hireable um, for future jobs. Um, and you don't even have to improve the quality of your code, <laughs> although you should still do that, of course. This talk doesn't focus on that because there are plenty of people who could do that uh, better than me. Um, speaking of me, you're probably asking, all right, who's this clown? Um, well, uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I started off in QA um, way back in 2003. My first ship title was on uh, was jointly on the PS2 and the original Xbox. Um, from there, I moved on to design. Um, uh, I worked at uh, Savvy Studios, and then it became High Moon while I was there. Um, I went on to go work at 2K Marin. Uh, I did level design on Bioshock 2, as well as uh, the DLC for that. Um, uh, and then like 10 years later, uh, I was like, hey, you know what? I'm feeling a little bit limited um, as a designer. I feel like I can I can do more and help out more, and I'm not super satisfied with the work I was I've been doing up until then. So I decided to become a programmer. Um, uh, my sort of entry into design was a little weird in the first place because, um, I mean, I, I I sort of took a path that was kind of how you did it at the time, but. The, I started in QA and worked my way up. Um, I don't know how viable that is anymore. So anybody looking for that specific career advice, I would not recommend it. I would go to you know a school for it these days and just go straight into like internship design program that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, I yeah early on in like my work at at Sammy, uh, I sort of ran into, into two different people that really like sort of defined my career trajectory. And one of them was a programmer, and I was like, hey man, I'm thinking maybe I should try and go into into programming, and he was like, well, do you have a degree? And I said, not really. And he said, well, forget it. You're never going to be a programmer. And I was like, all right, well, that sucks. But you know, that's life. And then a couple of days later, one of the lead designers came over and was like super friendly and was like, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll get you on the design track. Don't worry. Um, and later, he became my boss. Um, so uh, that set me down a path for a long time that I didn't really uh, try to correct until um, uh, I was just frustrated with with the uh, the way I was being treated by the technical staff and sort of being treated like I was an inconvenience. Um, and so I was like, well, okay, I'm going to do my own programming then. Uh, so I talked to some friends of mine who were uh, programmers. Um, and, you know, again, this was 10 years later, the sort of tone about uh, what kind of skill set and what is valued in a programmer had already started to change. Um, but uh, you know, there's still some knowledge I had to I had to backfill. Um, I'd been sort of a like self-taught programmer and hacker for you know since high school at that point. Um, so I needed to really you know firm up my um, uh, my formal skills. Like I had to learn about Big O. Like I learned it. I learned what Big O was at like 23. Um, so then from there, I was able to get some jobs uh, programming. Um, I kind of bounced around the uh, San Francisco startup kind of seen for a while um, and ended up at a massive entertainment um, where I'm now a gameplay programmer. Um, uh, so yeah, it's been a long, strange journey. Um, and I've done, yeah, I've done QA. Uh, I did audio scripting. I did level design. Uh, I helped with a, like, the rewriting a script for a game. Like 
I've, I've done a lot of different things. Um, and the main thing that I've learned from all those whatever, 15 plus years uh, is that you, just, you gotta be nice to people. Um, I, having all those different, different, having dealt with all those different roles has really, really taught me that, um, that you are part of a team and that team needs to have aligned goals and it needs to have mutual respect. The teams that I worked with that were the most um, smooth and successful were all because everyone respected each other. Um, so one other thing that I didn't really get around to saying yet is that I used to be a bit of a jerk. Um, I really believed that the truth was this sort of like righteous sword that I would just wield to smite the bad and incorrect things. Um, and that worked out well for me. People were like, oh, Scott is like, oh, he's technically sharp. He's really finding good bugs and he's solving problems. This is excellent. But then I started getting performance reviews that were like, Scott's really great at what he's do what he does, but I just wish he wasn't so smug about it. And I wish he was, you know, more kind when he found our mistakes and that sort of thing. Uh, so I realized that even though I wasn't, I, I was good at my work, but I wasn't good at my job, which is a weird distinction. But, okay, so why am I telling you all this context? There's still a sense in programming, like I mentioned earlier, that in mainstream programming, that technical skills are all that matter. And so I would like to change that. Uh, when I was a designer, I often felt like I was at the mercy of programmers for just scraps of functionality. I had to like go to them with these really specific use cases and then they had to see like, hmm, I don't know, uh, I'm not sure if that's really what the system was intended for and that sort of thing. When I made the jump to programming, I knew that I was basically going into career bankruptcy. Um, even though at that point I'd been in the industry for like 12 or 13 years, like I was losing all that backfilled experience that I could say like, oh yes, I've been working on games for this amount of time. Like nobody's gonna care about that when I'm going for essentially entry level programming positions. So I had to set myself apart. Um, excuse me for a moment. Um, and I remember the programmers who really stood above the rest in my mind, who really stood out were people that I wanted to work with again. Uh, they had two qualities. Uh, first, they were helpful. Um, when I approached them with my hat in hand asking how something worked or if I could get something exposed to the scripting system I had to use, they really worked with me to find a way um, to help or they were able to direct me to someone who, uh, who knew what was going on. Um, uh, the other quality I admired, of course, I've already alluded to it, was kindness. They just had basic human decency, like I'm not looking for anything really, really, you know, out of the ballpark here. Um, they understood that when I asked them questions, I wasn't trying to waste their time, even though it might have felt like that at the time, um, or that I wasn't asking them dumb questions because I wanted to stump them. It was because I literally needed to know how this works in order to do some weird thing I was trying to do. Um, kindness isn't just a thing that we can kind of like optimize out of our interactions with other people to trim down the number of words. Like it's, it's super duper important. Um, conventional kindness is good. Um, but again, there are plenty of resources out there to teach you how to be conventionally kind to people. So I'm gonna focus today on more what I like to call technical kindness. Um, so step one, um, obviously just like in regular kindness, uh, language matters. We need to be as precise and clear with our words as we are with our code. Um, we also need to be kind and humble when, you know, when pressed. Um, because if you're working with somebody to try and help them optimize their functionality or something like that, uh, uh, or change their implementation or whatever. You can't browbeat someone into taking your advice. Even if you're right, you can just show them how right you are and they are just going to resist more and more. You just have to offer your feedback and just hope that it's accepted and hope that the place you're working has a culture of acceptance like that. If you cop an attitude, it's only gonna hurt your case. Um, you want them to feel like you're on their side because you are on their side. You're all on team, let's ship this pig. Um, uh, we also need to learn to code switch. Um, we're often thought that we're, programs are often thought of as the, sort of the brains in the room because their specific kind of intelligence you need for programming is logical and rational, but other disciplines are of course just as smart. You probably cannot make the game without them. Um, code switching, of course, is, it's a linguistic te technique where you use different words, different tone, different cadence with different groups uh, in order to sort of increase your understanding and feel like more of, and be seen as more of a, an in-member. Um, like if you're talking to an animator, they about like bone names or whatever for animation, like they probably don't care that they're technically sort of strings, but are, or, you know, they're, they're sort of strings, but they actually behind the scene are string IDs if they're mapped to something else in like a lookup table, like they don't care about that. You just tell them, oh yeah, they're string names. Um, so let's, uh, let's go a little deeper on that and look at some specific phrases that you may have heard or, or even said, I'm, I'm not gonna, not here to judge. Um, and I, I've, I've absolutely said this, one. works on my machine. 
Um, an alternative to that is, I wonder what's different about our setup. Um, the alternative here, it opens up a dialogue for possibilities. Uh, it involves the user that you're dealing with um, and empowers them to help solve the problem with you. Um, as we talked about earlier, you're responsible for the state space of, of your code, of course. So if people can break it, then you need to harden it. Um, having someone investigate and fix their own problem, it, it saves everyone time. Um, it distributes knowledge so that if somebody else has a problem, this person you have helped previously is now an ally in helping out the other people in the studio. I personally maintain a hit by a bus page on our internal wiki so that I'm not the sole holder of any information. If I'm hit by a bus, everything that I could do can continue on without me. Um, uh, some people don't want to do this because they are they lack the confidence, like they hoard the knowledge because they're worried that they're going to be rendered obsolete if somehow everyone knew everything they knew. When in actuality, they're closing off their potential advancement um, because if they get promoted to lead or whatever, everything that they were working on previously breaks because nobody knows how all that stuff is done. And so they have to do this complex like roll off and it may not be practiced at like helping people do roll offs because they've been hoarding information all this time. Um, another one is that should work. Um, a good alternative to that is I expect that to work or we want that to work. Um, should is an imprecise word, has these, these two meanings. Do, does it mean that I expect it to work in the current implementation? Or does it mean, um, I don't know if it does, but I want it to. I, the distinction is, is important for content creators. So how else can we be kind? Well, again, technically kind, your tools or features must be clear. They have to be effective and have to be stable. Um, otherwise, you're wasting everyone's time, um, especially your own. Like, if you if your tools are not clear, effective, and stable, you are going to be approached by people asking how this thing is used. Like, how does I, I run into a bug? What happened? You know, what do I do with this? Oh, it crashed. Like, the more critical your feature is, the more of of course importance for clarity, effectiveness, and stability are. Um, and uh, code switching isn't just for verbal communication. Um, in fact, it might be more important to do with uh, error messages um, because you're not there to explain the context uh, in that moment. Um, so we need to consider the audience for our error messages. Uh, when your user encounters an error, uh, I say user, but it could be the person using your system or the person who's interfacing with your code. I want to be clear about that. We're not talking necessarily about an end user. We're talking about your cohorts in, in the office or co-working space. Um, pardon me. Um, so you're, uh, this user, their first questions um, when they encounter a bug are going to be, or, or an error, are going to be what, why, and okay, now what? We want to make sure that our error messages answer that with this happened because, and then please do this. Even if the please do this step is just, oh man, something is super duper wrong, like go talk to Scott or go talk to whoever. Um, so let's talk about some error messages. Um, this is an actual error message I pulled off the internet um, from looks like a Photoshop based on the icon. Uh, so what is the user's mental journey here? What has happened? Okay, uh, well, I, I don't know. An array was mutated, I guess. Is that bad? Why? Oh, I, I don't have any idea why this happened. Now what do I do? All right, guess I click okay. So, um, yeah, the user has no idea what's going on here. And of course, like this error message, it's it's technically correct. And of course, we know that's the best kind of correct. But it doesn't really, like, does Adobe expect the average user to understand what's going on here? As programmers, of course, we can understand generally what's happening. But even then, like, what's my action item here? Is the program that is the problem that I've modified the array or that is it's being enumerated? Like, is it, is, or is this some other process? We just have no idea. So compare that to this error message here. Um, OK, what's happened? Uh, well, I can't install it. Why? I've, you've uninstalled it too many times. OK, so now what? Contact support. Not, you know, not, not the most hopeful sort of error message, but um, sometimes that's the best you've got. Um, and so by making good error messages, we show our, our users and our coworkers, and hopefully our, our, these people are our friends, that we value their time and their experience with, uh, um, with our code or, or feature. So how else can we demonstrate that we care about our, our, you know, our coworkers time? Uh, well, talk to the people who are using your tools or interfacing with your systems. Um, we can ask for their feedback. 
um, better yet, watch them use it. Um, you may be able to see things that they can't quite articulate or these sort of errors and workflows or a feature that is going to help them, but they don't even know. Um, there's also the, the concept of the missing stair problem where um, uh, if you have a staircase and one of the steps is missing, everyone who lives in that house or apartment is going to know after they live, live there long enough, they're going to they're gonna be walking up the stairs, they're going to step in it and be like, ah, there's a stair missing. But then every subsequent time they hit that problem, they're just going to step over the stair. They're going to step over the stair, and eventually they're not going to realize there's even a problem there until somebody new moves in, tries to go down the stairs, falls in and breaks their leg. So we want to avoid these sort of analogous problems in our uh, in our tools and in our in our uh, interfaces and code base. Um, also, uh, anybody who's been working in games long enough is going to hear there's this grunt of frustration that somebody has when they are just you know down to the wire, stressed, and trying to get something to work, and it's just this. <sighs> like when you hear that, if you're a programmer, like just turn around, just ask them what's going on. Um, these currents of feedback are like important, and I, as a designer, like I was always like, yeah, it was always super frustrating to to not have anybody there to uh, to help me out. So when I became a programmer, when I hear those grunts, I immediately would turn around. Uh, and in fact, uh, I was working um, with a uh, working at Tryon. Um, and I heard this grunt of frustration, and I turn around, and it's uh, my buddy Matt, who's a designer, uh, who was working on something. And he, I was like, "Hey, man, what's up? Like, can I help?" And he was like, "Oh, I've I've been crashing a lot." I'm like, "Okay, all right, let's let's work on this. Like, what what are you trying to do when you're crashing?" Well, I'm copying this like huge amount of data, uh, and so I'm like, "Okay, well, why are you copying this huge amount of data? Can't you just copy it?" And he said, "Oh, well, no. It it only does. It basically described a shallow copy. It only does a shallow copy. It only describes only uh, copies the top level elements. And then I have all these like linked things like deep in the database that are not being copied. And so I need to go drill down to each item, pull it out, copy it, copy it, copy it, copy it all reparent them all the way up. And so, yeah, it crashed. There's that's way too many steps. So, um." So I was like, okay, I understand the problem. Like, let's see if we can. I, I, we looked on the crash a little bit. The crash was really, really weird. So I wasn't able to repro the crash. Um, so I couldn't quite fix it. But I spent my spare time the next like week or two, like making a deep copy feature. And so I was able to, you know, a little time later, I was able to go back to him and go, hey, like next time you are trying to do that that copy you were doing the other day, just right click here, do this, do this, and it'll do like you know, it'll do a deep copy. And so now here's the recommendation he has written for me on LinkedIn, like. It helps. Like this kind of stuff is important. And I, I I know I said earlier to be humble, but it doesn't count if I'm quoting somebody. Um, so uh, now that we are asking people for feedback and receiving it well when people give us feedback, and we're executing on that feedback, you might find yourself in a situation where word has gotten around that you're useful. And being useful isn't easy. Um, like you. <laughs> You make stuff, and then designers go into stone soup mode, and all of a sudden the game depends on some unintended unintended functionality. So now what? Uh, well, you accept it. You accept this weird love for your your feature or system. Uh, if designers are using your tools in these like weird and unconventional ways, like that's flattery. They have a need, and they have looked through the entire tool set, guaranteed, and they have found that that your tool or feature is the, the way that they think they have the best chance of getting their dreams into the game. Um, I mean, think about something like uh, like Excel. Excel is ostensibly a spreadsheet program, but like we all know that people have made just, just completely like wild things with it, like just amazing art. They've made Sudoku generators, like even like completely other games have been made using like Visual Studio or Visual Basic and, uh, and macros. Like some of that is like almost demo scene stuff, but I would personally get a huge kick out of somebody using any of my software to make anything that wild. Um, so yeah, even if it's unconventional, like accept the love. Um, and you want to support those uses if you can. Um, Obviously, if it's going to break some some vital functionality, you can't do it. Um, but you know, put some workarounds in. Like, don't be afraid to sort of not backdoor your own code, of course, but like add some exceptions for these these use cases. Because at the end of the game, like this isn't a spreadsheet. This isn't financial software that you know is or maybe financial software. Generally, for me, it's not. But like, this is a game. At the end of the day, the user's end experience is fun. Or is the most important thing. If that is fun for them, then like then do what you can to enable that, even if it is a little weird and like even not like technically the best thing or like not the most performant, of course. Um, so uh, yeah, um, also on, on that last point, like the games industry is super competitive. So 
you want to be able to support these things and have these responses to people's frustrations so that down the road, if you are interviewing with some other company, you want to increase the odds that somebody there has, somebody at the new company has heard of you and they're going to say, oh yeah, yeah, I hired them. They, they're awesome. They helped me with this. Or I heard about this time. They helped, they helped a buddy of mine with this, that, or the other. Um, so um, if a user can crash your tooler feature, that is on you. We need to ex we need to, again respect the the time for our coworkers. Um, I once had a, a an occasion where um, this was in, like this was an industry professional who assured me that their code didn't crash, even though I was going to them asking them about a uh, crash. I was like, "Hey man, your your stuff is crashing. Like, can we look into what's going on?" And he was like, "Oh no no, my my code doesn't crash." And I was like, "All right, well, it abruptly ended without performing the intended action, and it gave me no feedback about what was happening." And he goes, "Well, yeah, like," and he went in and like we repro the bug, and he like breakpointed at the like return zero, and I was like, "That that doesn't help." I mean, again, you're technically correct, but that's like the kind of rationale I expect from someone popping out of a lamp to grant me wishes, like not what I expect from a teammate who is on my side and wants to ship this game with me. Um, Again, need to respect the time for coworkers, and our actions need to respect that. Or, sorry, we need to reflect that respect. Um, and additionally, a program termination is indistinguishable from a crash. Um, Arthur C. Clarke said that, basically. Um, so, uh, instability is respect. Um, odds are everyone on the team is busy, including yourself. Uh, yes, it is tough and it's boring to test your work, but a few minutes of time now is going to save potentially 20 or 30 minutes per person in the studio later. So check the build before you wreck the build. Um, launching it in Visual Studio is good, but doesn't count. Like, You need to test as close to your end user's setup as possible. If you're making uh, an internal tool, that means launch it from a shortcut on your desktop. Um, like, yeah, if you are, obviously, if you're shipping on console, you can't, like, baking assets to the console and like deploying often takes time but um, if, if you like if you can in a reasonable period of time do it um, and if you can't then maybe that's a sign you need to improve your like your backend tools for like baking and deployment um, also genuinely like try to break your own tools like I know there have definitely been times when I've been like okay it works for this one use case let's just delicately slide this off and like that's not going to survive contact with like a content creator like they are going to like just you know, crash through the door like the Kool Aid Man, and like try and, and get the most out of your out of your feature. So really, really try to break your own stuff. Like give it give it the beans because if you don't, somebody else is going to. And you want to be able to find those bugs and fix them while you're already in the headspace for that project. If you wait and just submit it to get your like burn down chart to look nice or whatever, somebody else is going to find it and. You know they're going to find it a week later when you're elbow deep in like some other refactor or whatever, and you're going to have to like context switch, and that is just it, it's it's a productivity killer. Um, uh, remember that QA is your friend. Um, I'm not saying that just because I came up through QA, um, but seriously, like talk to them, make nice with them uh, when it's coming down to the wire and you need to ship this thing. Like you're going to want to find you're going to want to have somebody on your side who remembers that you are chill and that. You, yeah, you, that you treated them with respect. Um, at uh, at Massive, uh, where I work, we have uh, these things called dev testers, which are great. They're basically like QA uh, that can compile your code. And so, if you're not confident about your check-in, you send it to dev uh, to dev test, and they will compile it and they will test it themselves. Uh, so you can totally run with confidence. Um, so that is super great. You have checked the build, um, and now, uh, so everyone loves me, and everything is great forever now, right? Right? Well, no, of course not. Um, Self-improvement is never without challenges. So let's hit those a bit. I'm, I'm wrapping up. Um, I've worked with worked at companies with four people, and I've worked at companies with 400 people. Uh, the advice uh, that I shared with you today, it does scale well, but it can fail for reasons aside from scaling. So let's talk about some of the challenges. Um, what if you're not in it for the same goal as your coworkers? What if you don't know or agree about the kind of game you're making? Um, because your coworker had the same understanding about what the game is. Um, if you're running into problems because people are disagreeing with your sort of philosophical reasons for doing the changes you're doing, like you need to talk about it and get on the same page. Um, it is possible that your kindness can be taken advantage of with like overreaching requests or things like that. Um, being kind doesn't mean being a doormat. Um, no can be a hard thing to say, but it's really important to be able to do it firmly and politely. 
um, a trick I use at <clears throat> larger companies that, that I work at. Um, if you have like, uh, like if you're large enough or have like the right organizational structure um, and somebody comes to you with a request you really don't want to do, just be like, oh, well, you need to talk to a producer to prioritize that. Like that is a really good way to get them sort of like off your back and to push the problem onto somebody else who's honestly whose job it is to do that prioritization. Um, if it is something that I want to do, but I don't have the time for it, then I will I will do the same thing, but then I will go to the producer privately and say, hey, if so-and-so contacts you with this thing, like I, I'd like to find a way to get some time to work on it. Can we sort of work with the schedule? Um, there's also the fear that um, others might complain about you making them look bad. Um, like the advice for that situation really varies, of course, but um, but if if there is a, a, an atmosphere in the studio that resists basic human decency, like, and it usually comes under the guise of, oh, we just tell it like it is, or you got to focus on the work, like, that's indicative of deeper and possibly systemic issues um, that might be beyond your ability to deal with. Um, but if you can, change the workplace culture. Um, if you're if you're in a small company or uh, you are whatever company you're at, you have whatever passes for seniority or respect, um, uh, then you have the responsibility to make sure that your workplace is is good. Um, the industry is small, like I've been saying. Like we need to foster camaraderie and and be just just good to each other. Um, we all end up working together at one point or another. I work with like Aussies and Kiwis. I'm I'm from the U.S., but I moved to Sweden, where I work, where I live now, um, and I still ended up working with like ten people I worked with before from one point or another. Um, we just got to strive to be like the people that we wanted to have around when we were coming up in the industry. Um, so if you have any kind of clout, um, it's your responsibility to foster kindness uh, and to not tolerate jerks. No single developer is so good at their job that you need to tolerate them like alienating or berating coworkers. Um, because if that happens, your other option is. It's going to sound extreme, of course, but to quit. Um, you're going to find more opportunities at better places if you're well liked. Um, I've gotten interviews I should not have gotten, like technically, like I, I was not capable of of achieving the stated, uh, you know, bullet points on the on the job description because somebody was there. Somebody at, at the studio was like, "Oh, I know a guy. Let's 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 see if he's available." Um, it's a small industry. Word gets out fast. You've, for good and for bad. Um, you want to worry about being a good developer first. And again, that is working with their coworkers and just being a good person uh, before you spend too much time like developing your um, your like technical skills. I mean, it's great if you're like a turbo genius, like I, I'm not, but I've been able to survive in the industry for, for a while um, without being like, being super duper duper smart. Um, like I was watch watching the previous talk about um, uh, the debugging with Minecraft. Incredible. Um, like I, yeah, <laughs> it would take me a long, long time to be able to do that. Um, but uh, but technical skills are in abundance. Like you also need to have these soft skills and you too few people in, in technical industries understand how important it is to treat each other with kindness and dignity. It's the right thing to do. Uh, and even if you're being strictly pragmatic, uh, it's your, in your own best interest to not be a jerk. Um, not everyone has the privilege to leave a job. I understand that. Um, but if it's not working for you, you should be looking somewhere else. Um, everyone only has so many years and so many games and all of us don't squander your life for a company that's not aligned with your careers or goals. Uh, quick review, sorry. Um, we want to consider others, value the knowledge they have by asking them about their problems uh, and the knowledge they lack, you want to value that by giving them helpful error messages. Value their experience by trusting their grievances are valid, even if they're using your code wrong. Value their time by using your time to make sure they aren't crashing or otherwise blocked. Um, be helpful, offer your knowledge. If someone comes to you with questions about your code or tool, work it out with them. Uh, offer your experience. If someone is struggling with something you might know about, even if you don't end up solving their problem, they will remember that you tried. And offer your time, write documents, answer questions, listen to what, listen to what they're saying. Uh, sorry that I'm super quick on time. I thought this was gonna actually be shorter. Um, uh, thank you for watching my talk. Um, my name is Scott. Um, I don't have time for a Q&A. Um, hit me up at any of these um, locations uh, uh, for questions. Um, I make games on itch. I have a YouTube channel where I talk about uh, technology and how it works. It's at a really like sort of like broad level, like super basic, super advanced, but it's all in plain English. Um, so yes, uh, thank you so much for your time. And thank you very much, Scott. That was a really good talk and words to live by in the programmer <laughs> circles, I'm sure.